Graham for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Diamond. Um, can we just to continue with we're hearing a lot about this Volcker rule. We heard before from Ms. Waters that um, if all of Dodd Frank was implemented, it's possible that these trades wouldn't have occurred. Would it be on? Would it be safe to say that if you didn't do any trading at all, you wouldn't have any losses? Is, is, is that true? Yes. So if we made banks a utility and we couldn't compete with Europe, that would pretty much clear this up as well. Would that be one way to get rid of losses and take, take all the risk out? Yes, I think. Okay. So when we look at before, we were talking about the regulators, and, and my colleague, Mr. Duffy, was saying, he asked you, do you think the regulators can regulate J.P. Morgan Chase? You said yes. And his argument was, why couldn't they find this one trade? I think the point, again, my humble opinion, regulators are there to, to look overall at the major rules, such as maybe minimum capital requirements, maximum leverage ratios, maybe some concentration risk, some rules in place for that you're not too concentrated in one area. And those three things combined, regardless of whether you have a bad trading day, I, is it safe to say that we could never expect regulators to be able to have foreseen this loss of J.P. Morgan Chase? Yeah, I think, it's, but I think it's fair to say that regulators do the job. The system will be healthier. The most banks will be healthier. And the chance of having a systemic collapse should be virtually zero. Okay, but, then but, would but you to, agree? But, but to expect them to capture any one trade, I just think is an unrealistic expectation. Okay, well, I happen to agree with that. I don't think regulators will ever be set up to do that for the amount of institutions and the amount of trading and the amount of metrics that would need to be put in place to figure out whether something is a prop trade or not is, is an unrealistic goal and we're setting ourselves up for failure. And I think if we focus, and I want to ask you a question, if we focus on things like the, the capital requirements, leverage ratios, making sure there's not too much concentration, I think that's something that regulators can actually get their hands around and, and do a good job at. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Now, if I can get into the weeds a little bit, just to understand a little bit um, <clears throat> about your risk models without divulging the proprietary information, can I just ask, what was, what was your, your value at risk model, how did you calculate it? Was it daily, weekly, monthly? I believe it to be daily. Daily. Was it, do you know if it was a 95% concentration, you know, 95% confidence? I think we, we look at both 99, 95 and 99. I forget what the public disclosures are. Okay. Because my, my question was going to be a 95% confidence level is approximately two standard deviations. If you go to three, four sigma, you're talking 98, 99. Um, would that have helped your scenario? Or, or I'm just curious, would that have actually helped? So a VAR, VAR is just a basic statistical thing that shows how much volatility there is in a security or a basket of securities. There's nothing mystical about VAR. The other things which normally help is having limits at a very granular level and doing what I would call real stress testing. Like what happens if rates blow out? What happens if credit spreads blow out? What happens if Eurozone has a crisis? What happens if you have a credit crisis in the United States? So we do all of these serious things to manage risk. VAR is one measure, and in my opinion, not the best of them either. Okay, and I, I want to also go back to make a point. A at any point, I know the, the sums were technically insured by FDIC, but at any point, even now, knowing, having the benefit of looked at these trades, were the taxpayers at risk? No. And I believe one of the Fed governors here is saying that b the bank can bear $80 billion of risk before the taxpayer might be at risk. And lastly, I just want to, because I'm actually trying to get my hands around this to, to look at some areas of... of concentration risk, because we hear a lot about um, what I think we're doing is trying to turn banks into utilities, and I think there are better ways to do it. And maybe looking at concentration risk, um, when the financial meltdown in 2008, uh, much of the concentration was in, in, in loans. We know it was in subprime. Um, based on J.P. Morgan's size, just, just your size alone, other market positions were able to clearly uh, notice your London desk's activity related to somewhat illiquid credit indexes. Um, do you think reevaluating your concentration rate, especially in light of things that are liquid, is something uh, that makes sense for the banking institutions as, a, as a overall, besides just J.P. Morgan? Yeah, that was one of the flaws here. In this book, we should have had more granular limits. I didn't mention this specifically, but one would have been 
specific limits on anything that might be a liquid, specific limits on credit, specific limits on counterparties. We had some, but not all. And they all should have been in place. Thank you, and I yield back. And we Thank had you, Mr. Ackerman, for five minutes. Thank you. Um, 